Hello, everyone. Welcome to the exhibitor track. I'm Hitesh Bambani, a volunteer in the OWASP community, and I'll help moderate this session today. During the next 45 minutes, we'll be listening to Nicholas present worrisome web vulnerability trends in the race to innovation. Now, please submit any questions you have during the session in the Q&A tab which you will find just to the right of this video in the HUA platform. And I'll be asking Nicholas your question in the last 10 minutes of this session. Well, please note that the chat function is available uh, for you to leave comments um, and that is in the HUA platform as well, okay? So today we have um, uh, Nicholas who is a principal product program manager with Invicti Security. He has more than 20 years of experience in IT security with about 10 years of those focusing specifically on web application security. In the past five years, Nicholas is leading Acunetics, which is one of the flagship AppSec solutions uh, in Invicti's portfolio. Um, in, in the Acunetics platform, uh, tries to be the fastest and most reliable web application security scanners for SMEs across all industries. So that being said, Nicholas, um, please take over. So thanks, Hitesh. Um, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, share my screen. So this should be the right one. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on, on where you're connecting from and uh, welcome to this presentation. And today we'll be talking about some worrisome vulnerability trends that we're uh, seeing. Um, uh, every year, the company that I work for, um, Invicta Security, goes through and crunches uh, a bunch of data that we compile from our online uh, products. Um, uh, we do this for two reasons. One is uh, so that we can improve our systems. And this is sort of done on an ongoing basis. And uh, we tend to look at uh, the data in more detail on a yearly basis um, uh, to uh, produce this uh, annual uh, Invicti EPSEC indicator report. Um, uh, and this report portrays the state of web application security um, on a year by year basis. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, the report that we have released earlier this year in uh, spring 2022, which covers the, the data up till uh, the end of uh, last year. So uh, um, we'll dive into the results um, uh, in this session today. <clears throat> so a uh, short introduction, um, Hitesh has already uh, done this. Uh, my name is Nicholas Chiberas, I'm product manager at Invicti. And uh, well, at Invicti, our mission is to transform how web application security gets done. And uh, we and myself are very passionate about working with our customers and uh, partners to help them truly uh, protect everything and everyone with a uh, special focus on, on uh, web applications and web security. So uh, going on to uh, today's agenda, um, uh, we'll be briefly looking at uh, the report's methodology. And we are going to do this because we want to ensure that you, we all understand how we get our data. Um, uh, and then we will zoom in on uh, the findings. And uh, unfortunately, some of the worst, we'll be talking about some of the worst uh, security flaws um, uh, that are still plaguing us and the DevSecOps uh, teams today. And uh, finally, we'll aim to provide you with some insight into what can be done to improve the situation. Um, uh, well, not all hope is, is lost. So uh, before we do that, I would like to quickly introduce Invicti. Um, uh, we are a global leader in web application security since 2005. So we have quite a, a number of years of experience in the field. Um, uh, we help more than 3000 uh, customers of all sizes and all industries across uh, every uh, geography. Um, uh, and we help them to secure their web applications in development and in production. And I'm saying this because this gives a, a bit more detail into uh, um, where we are getting the data for, uh, for the report that we'll be looking at today. So uh, 
that uh, dive into the, today's topic. And as I mentioned, we'll uh, start off with uh, reviewing the methodology that we are using to gather the data. Um, uh, so uh, as I already mentioned, every year, we strive to get a deeper insight into the state of uh, web application security. And uh, we do this by looking at the data with the aim to find out if uh, severe vulnerabilities are actually getting scarcer. And uh, ideally, we start to find less of these as we uh, go along. At least that's, that's our aim. Um, uh, now, obviously, there are always um, um, uh, a high amount of uh, low and medium severity vulnerabilities that, uh, that we detect. Um, uh, but uh, we tend to uh, focus more on, on the higher severity vulnerabilities and ignore the lower severity ones um, for this report. So we'll be looking at, at the uh, higher severity vulnerabilities in this uh, presentation too. Um, um, and uh, we tend to focus more on uh, the type of vulnerabilities that uh, are or can be exploited in the wild. And when they are exploited, they can lead to uh, costly data breaches. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, to answer the question, are severe vulnerabilities getting scarcer? Unfortunately, the short answer is, is no, as we'll be seeing in, in, uh, later on in the presentation. And, uh, and therefore, the work of, of security teams and uh, security professionals remains important more than, than ever. Um, uh, and hopefully, you'll understand why in, uh, in the presentation. So um, for this edition of the Invicti AppSec Indicator, um, uh, we took a, we leaned on the uh, deeper and richer data set um, uh, than we usually do. Um, we have uh, analyzed aggregated usage data for almost 1,000 global uh, customers. Um, uh, and um, our customers, so these customers that we have looked at have performed more than 23 billion security checks last year alone. And uh, our products have reported over 280,000 direct impact vulnerabilities. Um, uh, the vulnerabilities we are going to look at in these presentations are uh, vulnerabilities that could have serious consequences if exploited by, uh, by malicious sectors. And also thanks to uh, various techniques used to uh, reduce the number of false positives that we have in our products. Um, our products uh, um, uh, and, and like these techniques um, um, are used to confirm most of the vulnerabilities being reported on. So that's one technique that we use to, uh, to reduce false positives by trying to uh, confirm the, the existence of, of these uh, vulnerabilities and not reporting only based on, for example, the version of a particular product that we have detected. So. Uh, um, if I recall correctly, our false positive rate when we had checked it was uh, less than one in 5,000. So, so again, um, uh, that proves that what we are going to talk about today are real issues and that the data we are going to see is, is uh, accurate and uh, therefore should be uh, reflecting the state of, of the world today. So uh, um, what does this mean? It means that all this information has given us um, a very holistic view of vulnerability trends from our um, automated scan results, um, uh, keeping in mind that these uh, scans have been done across multiple, across different company sizes and across multiple regions. And um, we'll dive into uh, the details in, in a moment. So uh, um, as part of, uh, of this analysis, we have uncovered some alarming trends. Right. Um, uh, so I've, I've already mentioned this, um, uh, and we'll be looking at this in, in more detail. Um, uh, so uh, as a as a quick uh, intro um, uh, to start out, um, what we have done here is pulled together a chart that uh, summarizes our top high severity vulnerabilities and also their trends for the last uh, four years. Um, uh, we are covering here between uh, 2018 and 2021. And uh, this four-year snapshot shows the percentage of customers that encountered at least one vulnerability of the given type. Um, uh, and uh, so in other words, um, um, we are showing how often we've helped companies automatically discover 
high severity vulnerability shown in the graph, uh, which includes um, vulnerabilities like uh, remote code execution, cross-site scripting, and other high severity vulnerabilities. And uh, you can see that the figures are hovering around the same number year over year or incre increasing slightly. And uh, well, we can definitely say that overall there is uh, no improvement um, across all the board. Um, uh, one uh, thing to uh, well, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, Invicti has grown in size, and uh, and therefore the number of customers that we have helped secure. This is why we are looking at, at percentages. Having said that, like the uh, vulnerabilities that were detected in uh, four years ago, um, most of these had been fixed. So we are constantly looking at a new, at a wave of new vulnerabilities that are detected year over year um, uh, in, in this chart. So if we uh, drill down a bit and we just look uh, at the data, um, comparison between uh, the year 2020 and 2021, and we can see a lot of the same or nearly no improvement. So uh, uh, most uh, vulnerabilities like uh, remote code execution and uh, server-side request forgery are actually on the rise um, between uh, one to 3% year over year. So uh, this is a bit um, uh, worrisome. Um, um, you would think that with all the uh, um, awareness that uh, um, companies like Invicti, but also um, um, organizations such as OWASP are, are trying to, uh, um, uh, to, to do um, and to raise um, uh, these type of vulnerabilities, we would, would see them diminish. Um, however, our report and our data seems to indicate otherwise. Now, it is important to understand that these trends, um, uh, as for example, the top of vendors like uh, remote code execution, um, uh, and uh, others like SQL injection, typically lead to some pretty serious consequences. So uh, for example, um, compromised backend data, hijacked sessions, or uh, forced actions on behalf of uh, users and services as in the case of uh, cross-site scripting, for example. Um, now, one of the things that we really focus on is that, uh, um, is that and that security teams need to understand, um, uh, is that this is a true risk and uh, reporting the number of low severity vulnerabilities is not of true value so that's another reason why we try to stay away from that and uh, in fact uh, um, having uh, a number of low severity vulnerabilities and reporting them as uh, being uh, of higher severity would actually be of negative value um, it distracts the team um, it confuses uh, the picture of understanding what the true story of the security posture is. And uh, that is one other reason for focusing on higher severity vulnerabilities in, in the report. So uh, let's uh, zoom in more and look into more detail at, at the results. And uh, we'll go through this year's top offenders and uh, look at each one in, in more detail. So the first one in the list, as, as uh, I would say one would expect, is uh, remote code execution. And uh, to understand why this is top of the pile, you only have to look back a few months and remember the impact that uh, Log4Shell um, had on uh, businesses around the globe as they scrambled to check whether or not they were vulnerable to remote code execution attack um, uh, in the wildly Log4J library. So, so um, uh, we need to keep in mind that remote code execution can have um, uh, far reaching consequences and it really is considered as the ultimate goal of a cyber attacker. Um, uh, and uh, the reason for this is uh, very simple. Um, uh, having uh, one single remote code execution vulnerability in a production environment is often referred to as a game over um, uh, as this puts the, the system at risk of complete uh, compromise. And uh, I'm, here I'm referring not only to the system where the uh, remote code execution vulnerability is found, but it's pretty much the whole surrounding system and the surrounding network. Um, as with remote code execution, you can easily bounce over to, to other systems. 
And uh, the problem with this is that, unfortunately, what we have seen the, uh, in our EPSEC indicator report, um, remote code execution has seen a steady and uh, worrisome increase since 2018. And in fact, it jumped 5% in frequency uh, um, in the last three years and uh, 3% in, in uh, between 2020 and 2021. So uh, um, uh, it's a worrying trend. Um, uh, so moving on, um, our, uh, the next vulnerability I would like to talk about is uh, server-side request forgery, or SSRF for short. And SSRF happens when an attacker is uh, able to uh, masquerade as a web application when communicating with other websites. Um, uh, and this might also include other applications or other systems. So uh, um, uh, how dangerous is, is this? Um, uh, and, and probably I, I must say that SSRF is uh, probably the most um, uh, type of vulnerability that is not given a lot of importance. Um, however, in reality, um, uh, this vulnerability is uh, getting more and more dangerous every single day. And many web applications are now, in, as many web applications are now relying on implicitly trusted APIs for internal communication. So that means that SSRF attacks can easily um, uh, be dangerous and um, um, as they can allow attackers to obtain an authenticated API access via a trusted server. Um, uh, and uh, as a quick example, in 2019, a misconfigured web application firewall allowed uh, a guy called Paige Thompson, um, he was a somewhat troubled individual, to acquire um, AWS access keys by exploiting an SSRF vulnerability. So Thompson had gained access to data from approximately 106 million Capital One customers in the United States and Canada. And although this incident put the world on high alert, SSRF continues on a, on a steady climb. And uh, we see that it is back up to being found in 15% of organizations in uh, 2021. Um, um, and that, as, I, as I mentioned, probably we, meet, we need more awareness on uh, server-side request forgery and the impact that it, it might have on organizations. And I personally feel that this is why we are seeing uh, um, uh, this vulnerability as um, so prevalent in, in, um, in the last few years. So uh, moving on to uh, another top offender, um, that has been uh, with us for, I, I would say, um, uh, a, a very good number of years, if I remember correctly, since uh, 2007 or 8, um, uh, at the time when, uh, um, and this time I'm talking about SQL injection, um, at the time when this was uh, discovered, most of uh, the web applications were still using uh, Microsoft Access as their backend database. Um, uh, so SQL injection is a vulnerability uh, that allows um, malicious actors to modify um, uh, and or replace uh, queries that an application sends to, uh, to a database. And uh, so technically speaking, SQL injection is uh, very easy to prevent with modern web, web languages and frameworks. Um, as uh, these modern frameworks try to uh, um, uh, force the developers to uh, um, completely avoid this type of vulnerability. Um, so uh, it's a persistent presence as seen from this graph is a reminder that application security starts with educating developers to correctly and consistently use the available safeguards. And in fact, we have seen instances where developers try to uh, um, uh, disable this um, uh, for whatever reason they might have. So uh, um, we feel it's, uh, this is a worrisome uh, sign um, that we're seeing uh, so many SQL injection vulnerabilities um, uh, and uh, we, we need to do more um, about this. So uh, um, uh, one example of where SQL injection has caused uh, a big amount of uh, problems um, and uh, um, is in uh, 2019, where an SQL injection vulnerability resulted in the theft of uh, text data of millions of Bulgarian citizens. 
and uh, the attackers were able to uh, pull records dating back 10 years. And these records were uh, then exposed on underground forums. Um, uh, and uh, these included things like full names, income information, personal identifiable identification numbers, social benefits, and, and more. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's one, once again, this is one of the uh, attacks that uh, should be prevented at, at all costs. However, um, I, I would like us to uh, maybe pause a bit on, on SQL injection and focus a bit more on it, because um, as I mentioned uh, before, this vulnerability has been around for quite a while. Um, there has been a lot uh, being done um, to try and avoid it, um, mostly because of its uh, consequences. And uh, considering that, uh, that uh, we are seeing so many high results on SQL injection, we said, we said okay, let's dig deeper and try to identify why this is happening. And uh, um, uh, in our data, so when we analyzed our data and we analyzed like uh, where we are finding these type of vulnerabilities, um, we found that 35% of educational institutions and 32% of government organizations, such as the one that we have seen in the Bulgaria example, um, had found at least one occurrence of an SQL injection vulnerability. And uh, this, uh, you know, we started thinking about this, what does this mean? And uh, the reality of application security is that it is not always about securing the latest and greatest cutting edge technologies. Um, uh, when we dug deeper into this, we found that uh, most of these web applications were using older um, legacy code. Um, uh, and uh, for most of these uh, organizations, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a significant expense and a significant effort to try and uh, modernize. And it might also lead to uh, significant risks because like changing a web application might also mean that uh, um, some functionality might, uh, might be lost in the process. Um, uh, so what does this mean for us? Um, uh, it means that we have to secure and keep in mind both legacy and cutting edge uh, um, uh, technology, use, uh, web applications that using cutting edge technologies. And we have to do uh, this um, uh, equally well for both types of systems, um, uh, keeping in mind that at the end of the day, we are not succeeding in our mission um, uh, unless we help secure everything and everyone um, uh, that, that we can, that we are able to secure. So uh, um, uh, once again, these uh, data points, this data leads to the fact that uh, there is an SQL injection continues to be so common, it's not necessarily that modern applications are not vulnerable to SQL injection, because in reality, that may be, and we have found multiple instances of where this was the case. Um, however, we need to keep in mind that uh, a lot of uh, these type of vulnerabilities boils back to the fact that uh, legacy code and legacy applications need, still need to be secured and still need to be checked for, uh, for vulnerabilities. So um, uh, I think uh, we can move on from SQL injection. And uh, the next vulnerability we have uh, analyzed is uh, local file inclusion, um, or LFI for short. And uh, this type of vulnerability allows bad actors to trick a web application into exposing or running specific files on the server. <coughs> so uh, historically, uh, this type of vulnerability, LFI, um, has been primarily associated with uh, PHP. So uh, they're persistent in our reports um, can safely be correlated to the continued popularity of PHP-based applications and plugins, um, uh, keeping in mind that uh, um, uh, a good uh, amount of the uh, internet or, or the web space is actually being run on WordPress, um, uh, which is uh, the backend of WordPress is PHP. So uh, what we're seeing here is that um, after a slight uh, dip in, in 2019, um, LFI is back in business. It increased in 2020 and again in 2021. Um, uh, so uh, we're sort of hoping that history will not repeat itself. And I'm saying this because uh, um, in 2016, there was an attack 
on a, on a website called Adult Friend Finder. And uh, this type of attack showed us how dangerous L5 vulnerabilities can be. Um, in this case, the, uh, the attackers were able to use this exploit to access information for 412 million user accounts. And this included uh, information such as emails, passwords, and confidential data about the relationship status. And uh, not only is this problem, is the problem this specific breach, um, uh, we need to keep in mind that whenever there is such a breach, um, the email addresses and the passwords obtained for these users, um, you are guaranteed that uh, attackers are going to try and use them on other websites to uh, gain access to user account and additional user information from the other sites. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, although LFI might not be high on, on our list in terms of security, um, uh, we need to uh, continue paying attention to uh, these type of vulnerabilities as they can be easily escalated further. So uh, um, uh, I would like to take a look now at uh, another type of vulnerability, um, uh, which is OS command injection. And um, this type of vulnerability, it uh, lets attackers execute system commands through a web application. Um, uh, and it is often overlooked. Um, uh, however, it saw an alarming jump between 2020 and 2021. And uh, many people might, might see this. And in fact, it's very similar to uh, remote code execution. And uh, the rise in command injection flows may be related to the popularity of modular and uh, containerized uh, deployments where each service or microservice potentially presents a separate injection target. And uh, that might explain the rise that we are seeing over here. Um, uh, so if you uh, want to know how bad it can be, we just need to look at uh, Shellshock, which is a widely known uh, vulnerability that enabled malicious actors to inject OS commands and take control. Um, uh, and uh, within hours of uh, the vulnerability um, uh, disclosure in, uh, in 2014, so the attackers were able to uh, exploit the flow and uh, create a number of computer botnets that performed millions of uh, DDoS worldwide attacks. Um, so once again, um, uh, it is not how the individual vulnerability um, has been exploited. Um, uh, but uh, as we're seeing in this case, the vulnerability um, was escalated to do um, much more damage than, uh, than what the individual vulnerability could do. So uh, we move on to another top of fender, um, uh, cross-site scripting. Um, uh, um, so uh, I think when people start uh, at in uh, web security, like the first two, uh, um, uh, vulnerabilities that they uh, start learning about would be SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Um, and uh, cross-site scripting is obviously going to feature in our report um, as it is one, it's still one of the most common flaws um, in the block. It saw a slight improvement in 2020, um, going to 65%. Uh, however, it uh, bounced back um, uh, to 71% in uh, 2021. So uh, we, we see this as a very common web vulnerability. And uh, to give us more explanation, it allows attackers to uh, inject um, uh, their malicious JavaScript code and execute that in the user's browser. And uh, though uh, considered a low impact vulnerability by many developers, um, uh, cross-site scripting is dangerous because it can open the way to sensitive data disclosure. Um, uh, and that includes uh, session hijacking, uh, redirecting to malicious sites, malware installation, and uh, possibly other social engineering attacks. So these are um, uh, make uh, cross-site scripting quite, quite dangerous. So uh, um, uh, cross-site scripting has, been, uh, has made serious waves in the past. Um, uh, a quick example is uh, the 2008 British Airways um, um, uh, attack, where it found itself in the media as uh, a cross-site scripting exploit led to a data breach impacting 380,000 booking transactions. And uh, security researchers suspected that the attack was linked to MageCart, um, uh, which is a hacking group that notoriously 
uses card skimming techniques and malicious code uh, injections. And uh, well, that was one of the many attacks that uh, that happen using cross-site scripting. Um, I would say that most of the others might go unnoticed because they might be infecting, um, affecting um, single users. Nonetheless, um, uh, cross-site scripting is uh, still a very important vulnerability that should not be uh, overlooked. And uh, yes, and as we're seeing here, um, uh, cross-site scripting is still slipping under uh, the radar. And uh, it's uh, we're constantly finding uh, this type of vulnerability over and over again. And uh, maybe we'll look at uh, one final uh, vulnerability, which is a cross-site request forgery, um, or CSRF for short. And uh, CSRF is a credentials uh, management flow, and it gives attackers the ability to uh, trick end users into performing unintended operations. Um, uh, once again, it's one of the oldest web vulnerability classes and it continues to appear frequently despite well-known uh, server mitigations, although we can expect advances in uh, browser security to slowly make it less prevalent in, in the uh, coming years, which is somewhat good to hear. Um, so uh, this type of uh, vulnerability is most often conducted through a social engineering attack, um, that, such as, for example, uh, via an email or through an altered link. And uh, in this case, um, instances of uh, CSRF will typically only cause harm to a single user that's being targeted. However, um, uh, if the attacker targets an executive or uh, a primary administrator, that single user's actions may also escalate to more dire consequences. So this is the reason why we, we decided to include uh, CSRF in, in our report. Um, uh, one example would be that the attacker might uh, um, be able to gain access to an administrative inf interface um, of the web application that would only be available to the administrator of the web application and then potentially um, uh, they, um, escalate the attack to either take over the, the website um, uh, or uh, download the entire database. So once again, uh, an important vulnerability to keep in mind. So uh, why do these vulnerabilities keep appearing? Um, uh, we, we, uh, we do not seem to be uh, paying close attention to, to this question and uh, we'll try to speculate uh, why. Um, uh, so uh, in our uh, focus to uh, shift to the cloud and enabling hybrid workforces for success, it's never been clearer that web application security needs to stay at the top of mind of four organizations, small and large. And uh, for those adjusting to this uh, new re reality of hybrid remote work, it's not an easy feat. Um, according to the latest ESG uh, research report, 69% of organizations found that difficulties around security hygiene and post-share management has increased in the last two, two years. And uh, as we all know, um, there is a massive talent shortage in IT security that is contributing to the ongoing problem. Um, once again, according to ESG, 70% um, uh, of information security uh, um, uh, association members cite that cybersecurity skill gap as having an impact on their company. So uh, um, less security people um, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, leaves web application um, uh, not tested enough for these type of vulnerabilities. So uh, in the previous edition of the Invicti AppSec Indicator, um, uh, we fielded a survey focused on the working relationship between security and development teams. And uh, what we can do to make lives easier for both sides of the uh, aisle. And uh, the numbers are staggering. On average, 51% of web developers' time is spent chasing security issues. And 80% of uh, our respondents to the survey noted that security processes delay delivery times somewhat or significantly. Um, we also uncovered that one in three security issues under remediation make it into production without getting flagged 
in the test or development stages. So uh, I would say that's quite a bit of information. Um, uh, and uh, that's a big problem um, uh, and one that can easily hamper innovation if left unchecked and leads to serious security risks that build up as uh, security depth when we are not looking. So um, um, this is why we, we need to constantly be checking um, our web applications. Um, uh, ideally, uh, any type of um, vulnerabilities are detected before uh, the web application goes into production. And uh, having said that, even once it has gone into production, we should continue checking um, uh, the web application since there can be uh, things like zero days, like we've seen, like the lock4shell, um, uh, which can um, uh, which, which cannot be checked before um, information about the vulnerability is, uh, is known. And therefore, it's once again, it's important that um, um, web applications are checked on a constant basis. Um, so uh, I'm sure all of you would love to know um, what we can do then and how we do keep uh, vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities at bay without sacrificing innovation. Um, so how can we win, win this innovation race? And uh, these worrisome vulnerability trends in our scan data are solvable with the right approach to application security. And here are just some uh, success stories showcasing how modern AppSec tooling has helped enterprises solve some of the battles we have touched on today, and we could not have said it better. So uh, <clears throat> these are um, uh, customers that uh, um, um, that have uh, um, provided us with some uh, best practices and that we would like to share with you. So um, although the configuration of an AppSec program varies from organization to organization, um, uh, there are foundational elements and goals at the core of every company with a healthy security posture. And uh, these include uh, um, the prioritization. And we, uh, we usually focus on uh, prioritizing secure design models that cover all the bases, um, uh, baking security into the pre-code processes behind the uh, application architecture. Of course, um, uh, this can only be done with the right approaches and with the right uh, training to, uh, to our developers, to our designers, to pretty much our, all our um, DevSecOps operations. Um, uh, one key foundational foundation element is uh, to break down silos between security and development and empower the teams to work cross-functionally on uh, security roadblocks. Um, unfortunately, we see this uh, very frequently. Um, uh, we often get uh, um, reports um, uh, being filed for web applications that are uh, being scanned by the security engineer. And the report would be filed by uh, the administrator of the web application because he would not have known that the security engineer is running his own uh, tests in the background. Um, so we need to break down these uh, <clears throat> these uh, silos, these impediments, and uh, get them to work more closely together. And hopefully they will learn from each other um, in the whole in the process. Um, we would uh, ideally make security a part of every stage of the development of the software development lifecycle. Um, uh, once again, um, uh, scanning uh, both production apps and those in development is uh, equally important. Um, uh, of course, scanning production apps should be done to uh, prevent vulnerabilities from making from going to production. However, once the web application is in production, um, that does not mean that it is uh, super secure, um, um, because once again, like any new vulnerabilities that are discovered, that would mean that they are immediately available in your production server. And uh, we uh, need to invest in robust tools and automate uh, everything as much as possible um, so that we fold um, uh, and, and like this automation should be seamless and fold into uh, our existing workflows. And uh, ideally we should provide and monitor analytics and uh, reporting, um, uh, which would allow us to monitor success and also um, uh, monitor for any failures in order to improve on a constant basis. 
And uh, once again, we should insist on accuracy from, uh, from the tools that have low false positive rates um, uh, and provide clear and actionable guidance for, for developers. So any tools that we use should uh, not provide generic guidance, but uh, um, uh, specific guidance on vulnerability. And uh, once again, um, uh, here at Invicti, we, we tend to focus a lot on uh, false positives um, uh, for the simple reason that um, um, uh, they would distract the, the uh, engineering team, the security team, um, uh, and uh, they would um, reduce um, um, the, the impact of, of our tools. Um, so uh, success in uh, modern application security requires more than just thoughtful and uh, combination of skills and tools. You need to, uh, we need to clear top-down initiatives and uh, uh, initiatives that the whole organization can follow. And we also need to keep an eye on uh, trends for uh, what we call as what we call direct impact vulnerabilities, uh, such as the vulnerabilities that we have seen earlier on. So um, yes, um, uh, these uh, worrisome vulnerability trends that we have seen um, from our scan data are solvable with the right approach to application security. Um, uh, having said that, it has to be um, uh, done on an ongoing basis. And uh, these are just uh, two success stories for that we have had um, uh, showcasing how modern application security tooling has helped enterprises solve some of the battles we have touched on today. And we could not have said it better. So these are um, uh, two of our customers that have left us um, uh, comments um, that we would like to share with everyone. And that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. Um, uh, so uh, I'll be happy to address any questions that uh, that you might have. Yes, thank you, Nicholas. Um, reminder to our attendees that you can ask questions in the Q&A tab, which you'll find on the right of this video. We can give uh, a few seconds for uh, you for our attendees to submit questions. And while we wait, Nicholas, I, I was wondering about um, the, the, there was like a huge number of checks that were done around 23 billion. That's, that, that's an astounding number. Can you tell us about those uh, scans or checks that you mentioned in one of the earlier slides? Yes. Um, so um, um, uh, just to make things clear, we are talking about 23 billion security checks across all our uh, um, uh, across all the scans that we have been doing. So uh, each uh, security check is uh, one attempt to find one individual vulnerability in a portion of the uh, web application. Um, uh, so uh, talking to uh, to our customers, we see that they integrate our solution into their development pipelines. And also they are scanning the same web application at multiple stages of the application lifecycle. So, so they tend to test early and they also tend to test often and worked with them um, so that they do this uh, successfully. So um, um, if you uh, look, if you think um, uh, that uh, most of our customers are trying to do this and we, we help them do this, um, uh, this translates into thousands of scans and each scan will run uh, several thousands of security checks, sometimes even um, uh, more than, than that, depending on how big the web application is. And uh, some of our customers are scanning hundreds and even thousands of uh, web applications on a, on a regular basis. So this uh, 23 billion is the grand total of all the checks um, uh, by our customers for, from our cloud-based solutions. And uh, if you think about it, um, uh, we, we, it's considering all the number of scans that are being done, um, uh, it's, it's a bit, it looks like a big amount um, and it is in fact big, um, but uh, you know, we're constantly increasing new checks and supporting new technologies. So that number is expected to increase in the future. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's, you know, scan often is, is good. Then um, kind of follow up on the, the, you mentioned that 
customers to use it in development and before production. So various maybe at security gates that they have in their in their uh, pipeline. And um, what is the number of uh, the proportion I say between production issues versus you know issues early early on in the dev cycle? Can you tell us about that? Yes, that's a bit of a it's it's a bit of an interesting question because from our perspective, it's a bit difficult to say um, if the web application that we are scanning is in production or not. Um, uh, once again, we try to uh, um, work with our customers to uh, to scan as early as possible. So uh, um, I, I would say that probably sixty to seventy percent of the scans would be uh, um, pre-production. Um, uh, having said that, um, uh, we also stress the importance of uh, scanning production web applications. Um, uh, as mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the presentation, um, these are equally important as uh, new vulnerabilities are, are always being discovered and are always being uh, implemented inside our uh, solution. So, uh, so keeping abreast of uh, any new uh, security trends um, uh, is best, and uh, these should be applied to uh, both pre-production and also production systems. Yeah. Thank you. And let me check if we have any questions there. All right, so while, while we wait for any audience questions. There's, um, I, I do keep hearing that browsers, they're always trying to have security improvements and try to eliminate some of the things that are uh, issues on the browser side, like cross-site scripting, uh, cross-site request forgery. Uh, do you see any of that improvement um, or, or how, how do we <laughs> try and reduce that? Uh, from the browser's side? Well, um, talking about uh, CSRF specifically, we are definitely expecting it to get less and less common in the next few years. Um, um, there, there are already known and tested ways to avoid CSRF, like anti-CSRF tokens, same site cookies, and there is a uh, good browser support for them. Um, but this also has to be done on the application side, and uh, it needs to be done correctly so it really works. So it will really, uh, will really keep finding some CSRF caused by errors in the implementation of these protections. Um, uh, we already see this uh, nowadays and uh, we expect to continue seeing this in, in the next few years. However, CSRF, in, from what we can see, it should be going down um, uh, soon. Um, uh, with cross-site scripting, it's really um, a race between new ways of injecting JavaScript into a site and ways of uh, detecting and preventing it. Um, uh, so you, you might uh, probably remember um, these uh, cross-site scripting filters that were getting built into the browsers. Um, uh, and these started like a few years back. And now the browser vendors have dropped them completely because um, they are deemed to be not as effective. Um, they can only stop a fraction of uh, the many cross-site scripting uh, possible attacks. And uh, this was uh, somewhat causing a false sense of security and uh, possibly making developers uh, be a bit more um, sloppy in, in, in how they try to detect and prevent these. So the flip side um, uh, is that the attitude that developers don't need to worry about uh, cross-site scripting um, uh, because the browser will, will stop it. Um, that's uh, going to change. Um, uh, and uh, now every web application um, uses JavaScript. So as long as we keep getting unsanitized user inputs and in applications, um, people are find, going to find new ways to uh, get uh, JavaScript to be executed by, by the web application in order to perform uh, cross-site scripting. So uh, in this case, in the long run, there is likely to be more um, uh, use of frameworks that limit the risk. However, um, uh, cross-site scripting, the way that we see it in some way or form is uh, likely here to, to stay, um, uh, even with all the work that's being done um, from the framework side um, uh, to limit the risk. 
Okay, yeah, interesting. I, I wasn't aware that some of these checks were had been actually dropped by the browser. So yes, that is concerning and all the more important for developers to uh, understand of the basic security needs and, and then code it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, I think that brings us to our session for today. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, that was very insightful. Um, and, and thanks, then, th thanks, Hitesh. Thanks yeah. for 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 um, um, uh, getting me here. <laughs>